All right. You guys good? Yeah? That was really good worship. Thank you so much. So good. So good. Gratitude. Isn't that something? Do you like that song, Gratitude? I like that. I like you got a lion inside of those lungs. When I first heard that, I'm like, oh, I'm serious. I got the mane. I'm, I'm so grateful to be here. I'm, I love Jesus with all my heart. I love people. And uh, I don't love people for what they can do for me. I don't love people for what they can give me. I don't love people because they treat me right. I don't love people because they treat me wrong. And I don't dislike people because they treat me wrong. I love people. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his one and only son so that whoever would believe in him would have eternal life. Jesus told the disciples, he said, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. He said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And right after that, he said, if you, forgive, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you retain them, they're retained. That's heavy. Jesus told them in Matthew 28, he said, I want you to teach them all the same things I've commanded you. So it was a command to the disciples to forgive. But that command also brought with it the reality of retaining. That's a scary thing because there's so much offense and so much stuff that you, that you go through in life. It's, there's so many things that you can be offended by, so many things you can be hurt by, so many things that, I mean, we can get an attitude with the one that loves us really easy, really quick. All we have to do is have a skewed view of who our father is. And then we have a skewed view of who the father is. And then when God so loved the world that he gave, we're thinking, no, God's a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Because when I went to the funeral of my son, the pastor said, the Lord gives and the Lord taketh away. Therefore, the Lord t chose to take him. So there's so many things out there that get twisted where we get a, we get a twisted view of who the Father is. We get a twisted view of who God is. And if my Bible and your Bible says in Ephesians 5 that we're supposed to be imitators of Christ and walk in love, then your view of who God must, it has to be very clear. If your view of who the Father is is twisted in any way, you can't represent that to a lost and dying world because you're still lost and dying. There's so many rooms, there's so many things to be offended for, there's so many things to have attitude for. Like, let's say we're looking for healing and God hasn't healed us yet, so all of a sudden we're wondering why and what we've done wrong and none of that stuff, none of that stuff should be here. There's a contending for healing and going after that with everything that you are, saying, I know God's word says by his stripes I am healed. I know that it says that. I'm believing for the full manifestation of that. I'm not getting an attitude because he's taken a long time and not done it yet. There are so many different things that you can get all twisted up and all whacked out. You've got to be really, really, really careful. I'm really grateful to be able to pour my heart out. I, I feel, I mean, I am an evangelist. That's my, that's my office, but I'm also a teacher. And my heart cry is to teach people who they are in Christ so that they can manifest him and not them anymore. My heart cry is to teach people about the love of God, to clearly define the love of God that was demonstrated in the life of Jesus, an innocent man who hung guilty on a tree, who never sinned, yet became sin so that you and I might become something. And if we don't see what he did, we won't see what we've become, and we need to see what we've become in Christ. Are you guys with me? Okay, I'm in teach mode, so I just, I, I really am, and because I'm, I am a studier of the word of God, but, but more than that, the word of God studies me. It's a, different, it's a different way to look at it. The word reads me. I read it, but it reads me. Every time I get in it, it reads me. It tells me things that need to change. He corrects me. He's my father. He's a, it actually, I read it this morning when we were in the other church down there at Cornerstone. I was talking about the reality of the discipline of the father. The discipline doesn't mean he wants to spank me, wants to hurt me, wants to beat me. 
The discipline is the actual instruction of God. And it says if you're not instructed, then you're not sons and daughters. He said God disciplines those he loves. I mean, when we're a dad, when I'm a dad and I've got kids and they're messing up, I'm going to discipline them. I'm going to, hey, listen, this is going to lead you down the wrong path. Actually, if it keeps going, it leads to this, and then it leads to this. And I tell them, you know why I know? Because I did it. Oh, my gosh, did I ever do it. Like my kids, like they think they get away with stuff. They, I already did it. The worst thing they could possibly do, I did worse than that. You know, I've got a 16-year-old, and I'm processing with her, trying to help her get through life. And she's, she's, she's wanting to know who she really is. All kids want to know who they are. Because she's not Todd White's daughter. That can be hard, you know. Like Todd White, this famous preacher, which is trash. All I am is a son who knows who he is. All I am is a guy that loves Jesus, that believes he's forgiven much, therefore I love much. If I didn't know how much I've been forgiven and I didn't believe the cross and I didn't be, believe the truth of what Jesus did, then I wouldn't know how much I've been forgiven, therefore I can't love. Because love is the byproduct of knowing how much you've been forgiven. Oh my gosh, it's really easy. It's like the simplicity of the gospel. It's not technical. This is really simple. Jesus said, unless you become like a child, you can't get it. And I'm in because I got that. Because I don't want to grow up when it comes to what people think growing up is. I mean, growing up into him, I want to do that. But I don't want to grow out of my childlike faith in my father and his love for me. I don't want to be some mature Christian that's bored in the seat, that goes through another service just to say they went to church because that is not the gospel. Jesus never told us to go just to go to church, just to do your religious duty. This is not about duty. This is not about your work. This is about the reality of you seeing something so clear, and you want to make sure that the people around you see it so clear too. So we come here to be equipped. Actually, the church should actually have signs on the door that says you're now entering the mission field as soon as you're leaving here. We're supposed to come to be equipped to go. We're not supposed to just come to have fun and leave. <sighs> God is really, really head over heels for you. If, if we would see it, it would change your life. If you would see who he created you to be, it would completely change your whole view of who you are. When you look in the mirror, you would see what God sees, and he actually likes what he sees. Like God lives in me, and when I look in the mirror, he expects me to see him inside of me staring back at me. Christ in me is the hope of glory. Jesus paid a high price to establish that. He paid a price to get rid of my junk, to get rid of my trash, to get rid of my tragedy. He paid a price to renew me in the spirit of my mind, to make sure that my mind is not conformed to the world, the culture. The culture is twisted. Like it's getting worse. I don't care who you are. It doesn't take a genius to see it. It is getting worse and worse and worse and worse, but not so with you, the Bible says. Darkness and deep darkness will cover the earth, but not so with you. Arise and shine, for your light has come. And Isaiah, it trumpets that loud. It says darkness and deep darkness will cover the earth. I don't know if you know it or not, but it's getting darker and darker and darker. But Jesus was called and referred to as the light of the world. And then Jesus says, now you're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. Jesus, it says in First John, or it says in John 1, it says that in him, in Jesus, was the light of all men. And Jesus came to his own, and they knew him not. In him was the light of all men. What was that light? Holy Spirit. So Jesus was the light of the world, and Jesus had the Holy Spirit living in him, resting upon him. So when you saw Jesus, you saw light. When he talked, you know, you see the pictures where Jesus has the light around his head. They might as well put it around his whole body. Because Jesus carried and was occupied by the Father. You got the Father, you got the Son, you have the Holy Ghost. You have the Father that sits in heaven. You have Jesus Christ who was sent here. And then you have the Holy Spirit when Jesus was 30 years old that comes upon Jesus, rested upon him, and remained. So the Holy Spirit, God incarnate, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the three being one. It's like saying the sun is bright and it's amazing light. The heat that comes from the sun, I feel the warmth of it. You've got three in one. 
You like the light switch, you hit the wall, that light switch sends the electricity to the light, you've got the light that lights up, but without the light switch, without the current, it doesn't work. So you have three in one. It's pretty easy to, to know, but you have God the Father sitting there, and then Jesus is crucified, he's resurrected, he spends 40 days with the disciples, and then he ascends into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, and then 10 days later on the day of Pentecost, Christianity is born. And on that day, the Holy Spirit came down and turned men into God-men. That's it. Let's just go home. That's what's it. So we all have the opportunity to be God-men, God-women. We, we have the opportunity to be people that are clothed with God, that are filled with God. Or you can be people that confess God but are filled with the world. So you can choose what you want to do. See, the reality of this thing is that the enemy is after your mind because he wants to cause confusion, he wants to cause terror, he wants to cause fear, he wants to do whatever he can, but 2 Timothy 1.7 said that God did not give you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. But that sound mind is very important because the power and the love don't work without the mind. It's a crucial piece of everything. See, sometimes we're, we, we, we come to Jesus and we surrender and we give him our heart. But God didn't want just your heart. It's not scriptural. The sinner's prayer is not in the Bible. I, I know. I'm not against it because I believe it. But if I'm just going to give Jesus my heart and hold back my mind, what did I really do? If I give Jesus my heart, okay, okay, Lord, you can have my heart. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. First of all, it says Lord, it doesn't say Savior. Although Savior is included, Lord is more. See, Jesus being Savior saves you from something. But Jesus being Lord leads you into something. And so he's the teacher. In Matthew 23, it says, call no one on earth your teacher, for you have one teacher. Call no one on earth your father, for you have one father. Father means who you came forth from. Are you with me? Okay. Don't let me lose you. It's like a, it's like a gospel puzzle. It is. And he forms it when I'm up here. And it's really awesome, and I love it, because I was down there, and he was teaching me something completely different in worship. I'm like, Lord, this is going to be so good. I come up here, and it's gone. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, it disappeared. But it's really amazing, because it's in there, but it's not done cooking. It's like bread in the oven that's not ready to be served. Because God is, Jesus is living bread. He's living water. And when you put scripture in, what happens is it goes inside, but your brain doesn't understand it. At first, you'll be like, oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. Yes. People are like, what? You're like, I don't know. <laughs> because God, God's word is alive. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And God's word wants to come inside of you, and he wants to change the way that you think about yourself. He wants to change the way you think about others. But the first thing he wants you to do is he wants to change the way you think about him. <laughs> Woo! Because if you see him for who he really is, you won't think about an earthly dad that treated you wrong. You will cry out for him because he needs to know the father that you just met. <laughs> My dad did the best he could with what he had, but he didn't have the Lord, so what could he give me? My dad gave birth, my mom and dad came together. My mom and dad came together when my dad came out of Vietnam. I'm 54 this year, though I'll be 54 on Christmas Day. So my dad and my mom, when they came together, my dad just came home from Vietnam, and he was messed up bad. He served two tours. His brain was messed up. And then when he came home thinking that he served his country, everybody hated him and called him a baby killer. And spit in his face, and my dad didn't do well with that. He served two tours thinking he was doing well. So my dad's twisted. He's not thinking really well, and he thought he was doing a good thing. But when he came back, it was like he was a baby killer, and everybody was against him. There were protests and everything against the Vietnam vets. So my dad was messed up, and man, it just got worse. And he met my mom, and then my mom and him, they started to go out. 
my mom and dad came together. They weren't thinking, let's have a son. They were thinking, let's get together. My dad was probably drunk. He probably was drinking, you know. My mom and dad come together. They're not thinking, let's have a baby. They're thinking, let's just be together. And on that night, there are hundreds of millions of chances headed up a birth canal, headed for an egg. Hundreds of millions of chances. This is real. I mean, scientifically, they'll tell you, and it's probably way more. It's probably like 500 million. I don't know. I use 100 million because it's easy for me to count. (laughs) I mean, not really, but if you minus one, it's easy to figure out the math. (laughs) So if 100 million others, 100 million total are swimming towards an egg, there's one purpose, and the purpose is to get inside the egg. So there's 100 million chances, and you know what the truth is, is that you made it in, so don't ever say you never want anything. But in this scene, there's 100 million chances going and trying to get in the egg, and there's 99,999,999 other chances that are already there quicker and they're before me. They have jackhammers, sledgehammers, they have chainsaws, they're trying to get in the egg, man, and it is every one for themselves, <laughs> trying to get in. It's natural instinct, and they, it's a big, huge crowd, and when I get there, they part like the Red Sea. <laughs> I don't have a tool. I don't have anything. As a matter of fact, I'm slower than everybody else. I'm like the last one, because the Bible says that the last will be first, so... <laughs> So I get there, they part like the Red Sea, and I jump inside the egg without a tool, without anything except destiny and purpose. And inside the egg, everybody else is complaining, how'd they get by, who pushed me out of the way? Sounds mean, actually. But really, only one makes it in. So I'm inside the egg, and I've never been trained by the world. My mind doesn't understand Man, my mind doesn't understand the problems of man. My mind doesn't understand my father, my earthly dad. My mind doesn't understand my mother's thoughts, whose soul has nothing to do with Jesus except survival. She has survival on her mind. She has thoughts inside when she finds out she's pregnant that, man, we're not ready for this. We're not financially ready. Who here is ever financially ready to have a kid? I mean, kids come, they just happen, but they're not mistakes. So the reality of this thing is, is I'm inside there, everybody else is out there complaining, and my voice that's never been trained or heard the world's voice says something. And what I say is this. Sorry, guys. I was predestined before the foundation of the world. Because the truth of that is scripture, and it says that inside of my womb, inside of my mother's womb, no matter how my mom treated me, no matter what she said about me, no matter how frustrated she was, no matter if my dad said bad things, no matter if my mom cursed me, it doesn't matter. What happened was God knit me there. My mother did not. So now all the things that my mother could have said outside of there, I'm not ready for this, I can't believe we did this, why did we do this, what is happening, none of that has any happenstance upon me once I get born again. Because see, being born the first time did not work. See, being born the first time didn't work. I mean, we do the best that we can with what we got, but we're trained and cultivated by the very enemy of God and our souls are trained by the God of this world. It says that Satan is the prince and power of the air. He's the God of this world. That's what it says. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's crazy. Because in the garden, he took dominion and became the prince and power of the air. See, we can't see it in the natural, so we think, well, you know, I don't know. But the reality of it is, is that we're in a spiritual war. This is not, this is not a natural war. This is a very horrible spiritual war that it takes the spiritual understanding of who you are in Christ to understand. Otherwise, you're trying to bang your head against the wall, beat your head against the wall, figure out who God is, and the carnal mind will never get who God is. The mind that we train with, the mind that we grow up with, as we grow up, listen, it says that there's a way, in Proverbs it says, there is a way that seemeth right to a man, but in the end it leads to destruction. Another proverb says, broad is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. Many are called, but few find it. 
That's kind of scary. Because when you look in the Bible and it talks about who's called, it says God called you. And who's he's, whom he's called, he's justified. And whom he's justified, he's glorified. It's really crazy. So understanding the reality of the call of God on your life. The call of God to be sons and daughters and to know him as father is crucial and vital. The beginning of your understanding and you must be founded and grounded on that bedrock. Are you with me still? Okay. I remember when I... When we first started to do Bible studies, I do Bible study, and you know, my, I came out of horrible, horrible stuff. How many of you have never heard me before? Raise your hands high so I can see them. Oh, wow, cool. Well, then you're probably like, what is going on right now? <laughs> it's all right. How many of you do not know my testimony? Wow. Okay. Awesome. Well, I was lost. <laughs> <laughs> really lost. Now I'm found. But I remember my wife and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm freshly saved. I'm brand new, like baby Christian spiritual huggies on. Um, excited about Jesus, totally in love with him, believe that he forgave me and he loves me. And we go to this house and I, I, they, they wanted to do a Bible study. So I just start speaking. My wife goes, She go, we get in the car, she goes, you are not that smart. <laughs> and she's right. I proved it in school. I flunked everything. I, I could care less. I never read a book before I was 34 years old. I couldn't read. I had ADHD, I had bipolar, I had borderline schizophrenia. I was jacked up. I couldn't remember anything I read. You know, on your report card, I don't know if they do it anymore, but I think they do. On the right side, it says how self-control plays well with others. I had zeros the whole way down that side. I was rowdy the whole way through life. I was radical. But I was radical because I just wanted to play. I just wanted to have fun. It didn't matter at the cost of anybody else. It didn't matter since I was little. And so here this guy is that can't read, and the Bible's the first book that I can actually understand. And I'm like, I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, I actually believe, when I read it, I'm like, oh my gosh, I believe it all. Like, I don't say, well, I say, yes. I'm serious. No matter how hard it is, I go, oh God, thank you. Like, he calls me here, and I'm here, and I'm like, ha, oh, yeah. I'm serious, because I can't get me here. My belief, my faith, and see, if I build on sand, I'll never get there. I have to build on the found, the, the sturdy, solid rock of Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and that is what gets me here. And when I get here, it's not like I'm above anybody, because the Bible says consider others as greater than yourself. So it's not about rising above people. Jesus is Lord. Like, you have to be still willing to wash feet no matter how high you think you're growing. Washing feet is not hard. It's actually pretty easy. Don't build your throne and think that you're somebody when really he's everything. Make sure that you love everybody that's in front of you. Don't think that you've arrived because you haven't. Make sure that you don't have any trouble getting on your knees. Oh, <laughs> that one got me. Because he's a good king and he loves us so much. See, if, if you kneel before God, he'll enable you to stand before man. Whew. He loves you unconditionally. There's nothing you can do to stop him from loving you. You're like, well, yeah, well, there's some pretty twisted stuff out there. I get it. It's because they don't know who they are. Because if you find out who you are, your whole life changes. You could never do the things that you once did when you meet him. Because he takes the old person that you were, he crucifies it. And you walk in newness of life, believing and understanding who God says you are. And who the world says you are doesn't matter anymore because God says you are. It's super powerful. You know, Jesus is with the disciples and... He, it's in Matthew 16, and 
He's in Caesarea Philippi. And he's there and he's talking to the boys. You know, they're with him. They're hanging with him. They're his peeps. You know, they're the inside crew. These 12 disciples that Jesus chose, which are rowdy fishermen. They are not, and tax collectors. They're not like highly trained, educated business people and engineers. These are guys that are uneducated, untrained. He's like, I pick you and you and you and Judas, you come too. Jesus picks the rowdy bunch. He didn't pick like nine Pharisees. He didn't pick people that knew the Torah and were geniuses. He didn't pick them. However, he did pick Saul, who was the genius of geniuses. But he wiped out everything that Saul thought he knew so that he had one focus, and that was to know him more. So good. So he's there with the boys at Caesarea Philippi, and he says, hey, guys, who do men say that I am? Well, that's easy. (laughs) A lot of people are saying a lot of things, actually. Some say John, some say this, some say one of the prophets, some say Jeremiah, some Lord, a lot of people are saying a lot of things. Yeah, but like, who do you say I am? I mean, I'm hanging with you. You're my people. You're, you're with me every day. I mean, they're with him during the day, but Jesus is gone at night. Like at nighttime, Jesus disappears. He doesn't sleep with the boys. He's gone. You know that, right? When you read the Gospels, every night Jesus is like, see ya. He's going to spend the night with the Father. And then he's up earlier than everybody else. I mean, Jesus did sleep in the day during the boat ride. (laughs) He sleeps in the boat ride. They're going across this stormy sea that God said we're going to the other side because Jesus never said anything that the Father didn't say. So God said we're going to the other side. Jesus said we're going to the other side. He gets in the boat. The storm hits. It's going to kill people. I mean, these guys are fishermen. Understand, their, their understanding of a bad storm is real because they've been fishermen their whole life and they believe they're going to die. So it's not like it was a little rain and the sea was a little rough. It was like really rough, waves crashing in the boat. Jesus is sleeping, waves crashing in the boat. (laughs) I guess he sleeps and holds his breath when the wave, I'm just, all I'm saying is he wasn't one eye open waiting for the disciples, okay, here they come. It wasn't that way. He's sleeping in the midst of the storm. The storm comes and they wake Jesus and they say this brilliant statement, don't you care? Don't you care we're gonna die? Which is pretty foolish to say to the son of God, don't you care that we're gonna die? We're gonna die. Lord, help us. Guys, he's like, where's your faith? That's what he says. I'm like, I had faith to get you up, dude. I have faith to get you up. What about that? But he wasn't asking them where their faith was to get him up. He was trying to get them to calm the storm. But the truth is, is you can't calm a storm if the one inside of your head is worse than the one that's out there. And what Jesus really wants to do when we get saved, when we come to him, is he wants to calm the storm inside. The world is looking for rest, and the church has been given the opportunity to step into his rest. And if the church doesn't step into the opportunity of his rest, the world does not want what you have. It's hard for me to witness, and look, my own guys are leaving. What did I do? God. (laughs) Just kidding. Thanks, JP. My God, make me feel. I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'll call you out if you walk out of here. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. I'm just having fun. I probably would, though. You do. Yeah. So the storm inside is the loudest storm ever. Anybody ever try to get quiet? It says, be still and know that he is Lord. And you're like, okay, Lord, I'm still. I gotta do something. <laughs> are you with me? Why? Because we're, we're doers. We really are. And it's okay to be a doer. But Martha was a doer. And, and, and she was doing a good thing. She was providing food for the Lord. I mean, come on. Like, Martha wasn't doing something bad. And Jesus didn't scold her. Martha was making food because Jesus is at the house. Like, 
I'm going to feed the king. That's not bad. But Mary is not helping. She's done. She's just looking. So Martha's like, Lord, wipe that off your face, Mary. Lord, I'm serious. This is real. Do you know Martha was making sandwiches that Jesus never ordered? Even though it was a nice gesture, he said, Martha, Martha. He said it twice. Martha, Martha. You are worried about many things. In other words, your mind is so consumed with so many things that you fail to see what's really necessary here. And what's necessary is what Mary is doing. And Jesus says this, Mary has chosen the one thing that's necessary. Now this is, you have to understand, when Jesus is saying this, these are all, he's saying these things, but nobody could truly connect with Jesus because they didn't have the ability to. So you've got these disciples that are walking with Jesus. So when Jesus rebukes the disciples for their unbelief, understand that they didn't have the ability to have the inside of the cup clean because Jesus wasn't crucified and resurrected. When he says to the Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and then the outside will be clean. You guys clean the outside of the cup thinking that what you dress and how you wear is good, but the inside needs to be fixed. Self-righteousness looks good, but inside it's filthy. And so Jesus is talking to the disciples. He's telling them this. And I mean, he's, he's a good teacher. But he's telling the disciples, and you know, I got to go. Like, I got to go. Because in Matthew, in Matthew 16, when Jesus is in Caesarea Philippi, you've got Jesus that says, who do men say that I am? And he says, who do you say I am? And Peter goes, you're the Christ. You're the son of God. You're him. Jesus is like, whoa, Simon. You didn't come up with that one yourself. Flesh and blood cannot reveal that to you. That is only revealed by my father. The father revealed that to you. Way to go, Simon. And you know Simon's like, yeah. <laughs> right? Because they've all got this thing going where they, they want to be first. And Jesus is like, who, who wants to be first must be last. And Simon's like, well, then I'm behind John. <laughs> probably behind John because John knew that he was the disciple that Jesus loved. So he probably took the back. So Peter runs behind John. Jesus like Peter. Right? It's real. He says, to, he says to Peter, he says, you know what? This is amazing. Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father did. And then he says something so significant that every bit of Christianity must be formed and founded on. Because if it's not founded in this place, you're going to be deceived. Jesus says, I tell you this, Peter, the Father revealed this, and upon this rock, this rock, this bedrock, this, this foundation right here, this is the foundation, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is the revelation then I'm going to build my church on. That's what he says. I'm going to build my church on the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what he says to Peter. Are you with me? This is in Matthew 16. I'm telling you because you can look it up later if you're taking notes. Just take the scriptures down. You'll see it. It'll all piece together like a big puzzle because it's just coming to me now. So it'll come. So he says, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And then he makes this significant statement. And he says, and the, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What is he talking about? Is he talking about the gates of hell not prevailing against the church? Or is he talking about the gates of hell not prevailing against the rock? Because people have been taught a lot of things, but he's not talking about the church as a building. He's talking about the church's belief system that the gates of hell are constantly trying to come after to change your bedrock. Okay, all right, I'm gonna come down here. Oh, I did legs today, ooh, not good. I'm not coming down here again. My gosh, I did squats today and I did these lunges and that, does anybody do squats? My gosh, they're terrible. And then I did these lunges and I'm like, I feel like a little baby right now. Then I got to the hotel and I'm excited and I'm gonna go run steps. So I've got a, 
I'm staying at a hotel, and I'm like, okay, we've got 11 stories. It's going to be awesome. I run five stories, and my legs are killing me. No, God. Got to get the rest of the way up. So I take a break five stories in, and I run the rest of the way up. And I did that today, so I'm in. Yeah. Oh. Yes, I did. At the end, I did. But I did it several times. I didn't stop there. I did it again and again and again. I did 30 minutes and hurt myself. Get in the elevator. <sighs> Someone's in there. Hey, how are you? I'm okay. You okay? Yes, I am. I'm in love with Jesus. How are you? The elevator, the elevator is the best place ever. They can't go anywhere. They're trapped with you. You'll know where you are in Christ if you can talk about him in the elevator. And people push buttons to get out. They turn around, they face the door. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's so good. I've seen some really freaked out people, man. When it's really packed with people, it's really packed. You know, you're, or like you're in an airport and you're on the elevator and you got like 25 people in there. You know, the big elevators where you got to get to your next gate, like Brazil or, or wherever, and you're, you're packed in there. Hey, guys. Yeah, I got, I got great news for all of you. What is it, bro? Jesus loves you all. Oh, God. And then the elevator takes like a long time to get there. If you're happy and you know it, use your mouth, right? I remember going, I'll just tell you this real quick. I was in South Africa and I was with Daniel Kalen and we were preaching the gospel. Oh, no, I was in Africa. And we were preaching the gospel and doing a fire conference and it was powerful with Reinhardt Bunke and so powerful. And I'm in the hotel and it's a predominantly Muslim um, place and Emirates has a lot of Muslim pilots and all that. So I get in the elevator, it's glass, you know, and Daniel's outside. And I sit like this, and, and then, uh, uh, a pilot gets in with all of his kids, and they're, they're Muslim and they're packed in. I said, Hey guys. And the dad looks at me and he goes, Yes. I said, You have a beautiful family. I said, Yeah. He said, Thank you very much. I said, Do you know how much Jesus loves you? He said, Allah loves you. And I said, That's not in the Quran. Allah doesn't love. There's 99 things that he is, but love's not one of them. And he's arguing with me, right? And I'm like, oh, we don't need to argue. Let me pray for you. And the kids are filming me. <laughs> the dad goes, put your phones down. They go, no, daddy, this is good. <laughs> and I'm talking to him about Jesus' love, and I got to share my testimony with him. And he's like, wow. And I said, and I had a dream three nights in a row where Jesus came to me. And aren't dreams sacred? And he looks at me and he goes, they are. He goes, why aren't we moving? I said, oh, you've got to put your key in the elevator. Thing. <laughs> so we were on there for like five minutes in an elevator, not moving. And Daniel is laughing so hard watching me witness because he knows what I'm doing. I'm sharing the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, man. I'm not afraid of the gospel. It is the power of God. It says that in Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of this gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation for them that believe. What does the word believe means? The believe. The word believe means to be fully convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt. Wait a second. So you're telling me that I can be absolutely convinced beyond any shadow of any doubt, no weird gray area in my belief system, and that's possible. It's possible. And if it's not, then the gospel's not real. So is it possible to be so fully, absolutely convinced of God's love for you that nothing can interfere with that? Yes, it is, because I'm possessed by it. I am possessed by God loves me, and you can't take it away from me. You know what you can't do? You can't take away what you never gave me. See, God, I'm accepted in the beloved. If I'm accepted in the beloved, how can you take away what you never gave me? You never gave me this. He did. You can't even reject me. People are like, oh, yes, I can. No, you can't because love never fails. This is, like, really powerful. I mean, it's really good news. It's the best news ever. Like, you can't even kill me and take this away from me. You know, I get death threats. I get that stuff all the time. And, oh, no, please don't threaten me with eternity. It's the weirdest thing. Like, what, it, look, one day I'm going to put off this tent, but when I do, it's going to be like this. <gasps> yeah. 
and I'm gonna enter into glory with Jesus and he's gonna say, well done. Jesus crushed the fear of hell, death, and the grave. Now, if you don't know Jesus and you don't know where your eternity is, then you should be afraid. If you don't know that you're going to be in eternity with Jesus and if you don't know that you're going to enter into eternity with him, then you should be very afraid of entering into eternity without him. It's called the fear of death. But Jesus paid a price for us to be free. He didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So this, this truth that I'm sharing with you, the doctrine, the truth of the Bible, because everything I'm sharing with you is scripture, whether you know it or not. So we were like, well, he didn't even open the Bible. Oh, no, I am an open Bible. I, I promise you, I, I don't have my own idea. I have the truth. See, it's the truth that set me free. It's not my idea that set me free. I don't have a fancy idea of freedom, and I've attained it. No, 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 I'm no longer in bondage. I'm not a captive to sin. I'm, sin is no longer my master. Sin is a dethroned monarch in my life. <laughs> the last thing I want to do is sin against somebody. I love people. That doesn't mean I don't make mistakes, but that means that my habitual nature to do it is gone. My habitual nature to do drugs is history. My habitual nature to hurt people is done. My habitual nature to hate people, because it's normal. You don't have to have a class on hate. You don't have to teach kids, well, kids, today we're going to learn how to be angry. I'm going to teach you. You learned that before kindergarten, buddy. Preschool, you learned it before preschool. Man, I have little kids. Just put a toy in between two of them. You don't got to teach them mine. You don't have to have a class on mine. A class on selfishness. class on anger. Last on jealousy. Think about that. Just think with me here. You, do you have to be trained to be angry? Do you have to be trained to hate? Do you, have to, do you have to be trained to hate something, to be really mad at somebody? Do you have to be trained to be jealous and want to hurt somebody for taking your girlfriend? Do you have to be? No, you don't. You learn that in life. It's, not, it's something that comes with the package. It comes with your born first package. You come, when you're born into the world, you're born of flesh, and that stuff is a flesh package you get that gift and that gift is not heavenly people are like well i'm a skeptic well you didn't get that gift from god god did not give you the gift of skepticism you got that from the first adam you were born with that that is called a sin nature you were born with it tell me that god gave you the gift of doubt that's not even that's just weird well god taught me how to doubt no he didn't you, you were born with that. Now you get born again so that that old man can actually die and you can be, come on guys, this is weird. We're talking about spirit stuff. We're not talking about physical stuff here. We have to die to the way that seems right to a man. We have to live to the way that is right to God. But pastors are not responsible for making you understand this. Jesus paid a price for you to have relationship with the Father and for you to be taught by him. Call no one on earth your father. Does that mean that I'm not supposed to honor my mother and my father? Absolutely not. It does. The Bible says to honor them. But I have to know who I've come forth from. The reality of it is, is my identity is not determined by what my mom did or didn't do or what my dad did or didn't do. My identity is determined by who my father is. But if I don't understand what he says about me, then I'm going to live by what my dad said to me, what my mom said to me, with hurt, with pain. And then all my life, maybe my dad never told me he loved me. Maybe he struggled with that because he never heard it from his dad. I mean, my, dad, my dad's dad died when he was five. So maybe my dad had a trouble with that. Maybe he had trouble with showing affection. Maybe he had trouble with that. So all of a sudden, I wait my whole life, my whole earthly life and I'm waiting for my earthly dad to finally tell me he loves me but what you're doing is you're waiting to drink from a dry cup there's no life in it you think psychologically that you'll be fixed but it doesn't fix you psychologically then you go back and say what about all the years you never said it 
and then we think according to the way that seems right to a man, and all of a sudden, we are the product of how people have treated us, what they've said about us, what they've done to us, what they never did for us, and all of a sudden, our whole life is based on that one thing instead of the one thing that Jesus says is necessary. And then there are a lot of people that do the works and keep doing sandwiches and keep making and keep working and keep working. You, get, you come into the kingdom, you get born again, you're, how can I help? How can I help? How can I serve? And it's right to serve, but it's wrong to, give your, to get your identity through what you do. You need to get your identity through who God says you are. It's great to help. I mean, honestly, in church, 10% of the people do 100% of the work. So that's across the board. Because we so much want to eat, but we don't want to help. Just saying. I got a pastor right beside me. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and he's not, but he says it with a smile. He's not complaining. He's not angry about it. But it's true. Why? Because we haven't learned how to love. Because love serves, man. Love will scrub toilets. It don't matter. I do it because I love you. Do I like what I do? If I'm thinking about Jesus when I do it. <laughs> Lord, take this sin. A mom folding the kids' laundry, never, ever, ever is it the right way. It's always inside out. Yeah. Every pant leg, Father, I thank you that you're turning my kids inside out, God. <laughs> it says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord and not the people. Even though you're doing it for people, consider it doing it unto him instead of just doing it for people. Because if I don't get the thank you from people, then I don't feel appreciated. And then that goes into that whole thing again. Nobody appreciates me. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. Look at all that I do. I'm tired of doing this. Husband's married to a wife, and all of a sudden, the wife just gets fed up because she's, all she's done is help and do whatever, and he, she never gets appreciated. So all of a sudden, instead of watering her own lawn, she goes and looks on the other side of the fence. Ooh, that one touched a good nerve. Because if you would water your own lawn with the reality of who God says you are, and you would see that. And I'm not just talking about wives, I'm talking about husbands too. You know, I'm the spiritual head of this family now. My husband's supposed to step up to the plate. He's not stepping up, and I'm tired of being the leader. And it shouldn't be like that. Look at the Bible. No, 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 no. You are supposed to love. Ooh. Love keeps no record of. Love is patient. Love is kind. Welcome to the gospel where it's no longer about you, it's about him. <clears throat> if anybody was a doormat, it would have been Jesus. Can you imagine? Peter, I'm sick and tired of this. I'm done with this. I can't, you, you're really gonna deny me again? I mean, I know I said it, but you're really doing it. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that coming out of Jesus' mouth? Can you imagine him being upset like he's got one nail in his wrist and then they're pulling the other arm out? That hurts. I don't think so, buddy. You know what? Get off of me. Angels, boom. <laughs> he could have. He had the power to do it. Yet he sat there, bled, and died on the tree looking at a people that hated him, saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know who they are. They don't know what they're doing. Could it be that people treat you bad because they don't know who they are? And could it be you got hurt by it because you didn't know who you were? Could it be? Maybe. Just saying. Because if you got offended by people that should have known not to do it, you should have known who you were when it came. So you're, none of your excuses are going to work. <laughs> when you stand before God, well, you don't know how they treated me. Um, I was living in you when they did it. You didn't know I was there. Because you failed 
to completely fill yourself with the truth of who I say you are. You live by the untruth that the world was bringing your way. I would love, see, my job is to make you very accountable. People are like, oh, yes, get to hear Todd. Oh, my job is to bring you to an accountability that you weren't before you came in the room. So you have much more to be convicted of. (laughs) Praise God. That's my job. My job is to bring you to a greater accountability so you don't have any more excuses. So Peter says, you're the Christ. Jesus says, Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you because only the Father can reveal that. Only the Father can tell you that Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation of who he is, the revelation of what he's done, the only one that can reveal that to you. Paul said in Ephesians 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 16, 17, I pray for you that the Father, that the Lord God might give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Why? Because that's the rock. The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that you might know the hope of his calling. Not even your calling. <laughs> that you might know the hope The hope, what kind of hope? God's hope. You might know the hope, which is a earnest expectation, the earnest expectation of God's call on your life. Oh my gosh. What does he call you to be? Jesus was the son of God, but he was also the son of man. So what is God calling you to be? He's calling you to be sons and daughters. Why? Because God says, I, Jesus told the disciples, I will not leave you as orphans. I will send another Guys, it's going to be better for you that I go, because if I don't go, he won't come. I got to go. I mean, Jesus is about to tell Peter he's about to go here right after Jesus just gave, you know, Peter got the revelation. Blessed are you, Peter. We'll go back to... We'll go back to Matthew 16. Blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. And I tell you this, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell come to stop you from seeing the revelation of Jesus Christ as the foundation for everything that we have. A couple of scriptures later, Jesus says, by the way, I'm going to die. And Peter is like, no. Why? Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to Simon Peter. He's a fisherman. I mean, come on, their first encounter, what was it like? Simon Peter He's fished all night long. He's a professional fisherman. He's been fishing his whole life. He knows what he's doing. He comes into port. Nothing's on the boat. Jesus says, hey, guys, let's go fishing. Simon's like, "Uh, we fished all night. Why do they fish at night? Because the fish come up during the nighttime. They go down during the daytime. So Simon is like, "Um, sure, let's go. Inside, he's thinking, how dumb is this? Why? Because they wouldn't fish during the daytime. They would fish at night. That's why they do what they do. That's their livelihood. So they go out to fish. Jesus says, hey, throw your nets over there. So they throw their net over there, and what happens? (laughs) What? What? Peter's like, what? At first, you know his endorphins are cranking. You know he's like, whoa, this is the best catch ever. What do we do? Guys, help us. Like, this is amazing. They bring the fish into the boat. Simon, the adrenaline stops. He's looking at the fish. He gets hit with the revelation of God's goodness. Because Simon, on the way out, was mocking in his mind. But then they go fishing. Now his endorphins are cranking. I just scored the biggest mother load ever. This is going to feed my family for a long time. I mean, the paycheck in this is amazing. It's awesome. And Simon's thinking, yes, woo Lord, away from me, I'm a sinful man. That's what he says. He gets rocked by the kindness of God. Jesus is like, get up, Simon. He's hooked. I'm following this dude. He gives up his fishing job. I don't even know what happened to the catch that day. It doesn't matter. Peter was caught. He's following Jesus, and now Jesus is the best thing ever. So if you lay the context and you see the reality of this, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to Peter, ever. 
So he's like, guys, by the way, I'm gonna die. And you know, Peter really believed what he said. This will never happen to you, Lord. Not on my watch, never. Because on that day that Jesus was taken, Simon had a knife. Like he cut off Malchus's ear. That was a crazy night. Jesus is like, Simon, what are you doing? There you go, Malchus. You know Malchus is gonna be in heaven, right? He had to go along with the program, but you ain't forgetting an ear chopped off, put it back on. I don't care who you are. There's still blood all over your clothes when you get home that night, yet you have your ear. Tell me the goodness and kindness of God in that situation didn't rock Malchus's heart. I bet him and Peter are pals up there. It'd have to be. You'll realize your unforgiveness down here was no good, buddy. Oh, this is so good. It's so rich. The word is so rich. It's so beautiful. It's so lovely. So Simon freaks out when Jesus says he's going. And he says, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus says to Simon, this is beautiful. Get behind me, Satan. Hold on, Lord. I don't know if you remember, but just a couple of sentences ago, you said, blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but the Father did. Do you remember the Father revealed this to me? I'm the guy. That's what, are you, I mean, I'm serious. This is real. So Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but what happened? Flesh and blood did jump up in Simon when he said, this will never happen to you. What does that mean? Because Jesus didn't say, get behind me, Satan. You're practicing Ouija cards or Ouija board, or tarot cards, or you're having seances, or you're practicing witchcraft. <laughs> that'll, that'll, that'll go there. That'll. Sorry, she was filming, and I went up to her. Something. Sorry. <laughs> but the truth is that Simon wasn't into any of that stuff. He's walking with Jesus. He wasn't saying that. He said, get behind me, Satan, to, to Simon, who just heard from God. Why? He says this, for your mind is full of the things of man. Your mind is full of the way that seems right to a man. What does that mean? That means that when I'm having a hard time because somebody's stressing me out, and I say, hey, back off, I'm only human. What you're saying is, leave me alone, I'm only demonic. But we don't think that way because it's not demonic, it's the way that we've been trained. But really, when you think about it, it is demonic thinking. Because we've been trained by the God of this world. That one's a hard one to swallow. But it's the truth, eat it. Taste and see, the Lord is good. He wants to change the way you think so he can change your reaction. What if he changed the way that you think? Your reactions would be different. The way that you react to people would be completely different. Why? Because the foundation of your whole life is transformed and changed to think like God thinks. It changes everything. So he said, get behind me, Satan, for your mind is full of the things of man and not the things of God. What's he saying? There's a huge contrast to the way that seems right to a man and the way that is right to God. And the way that is right to God only comes out of the foundation of who we are in him. And the revelation of Jesus Christ is that rock in which we stand. Are you guys, did that help at all? You guys are doing amazing. I'm sorry to keep you. Thanks for standing with me and sitting with me and smiling the whole time. I love that. It's so good. Well, maybe if you played a couple of keys, like real light, maybe it'll help us go down easier. Thank you. You don't, not real loud though, or I'll start singing and then we're done. Oh, before I forget, I have a book here. I, I, I never wrote a book. I can't even say I wrote this one because somebody took what I say and wrote it down, which is the only thing. I can't type. I'm, a, I'm not good at that. My kids can type way faster than me. My, my six-year-old can type faster than me. It's crazy. So what we did was we put my life journey with Jesus from lost to found, from blind to see, from dead to alive. And then 
my journey into the supernatural, believing God, getting really, 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 really pounded by the people close to me that you need to stop, you need to chill out, you can't just walk this way, you can't just pray for everybody. I put it in here because it's a journey that will help you get through people not understanding who you are. And it's all scripturally found and it's really amazing. But um, one of the things we're seeing with this is we're seeing prodigals come home. They read this book and, and repent and come home. I love that. I love it. And then we're also seeing, we're also seeing many atheists come to Jesus. They read this. It doesn't look like, doesn't look like a Jesus book. It looks like some dude with many colors behind him. Some dude with dreads. Like, who is this guy? That Todd White story. What? What? But it's really amazing. So who here is a prodigal that they're waiting to come home? Come here. Let me give this to you. I'll come to you. You don't have to come to me. Oh, oh, oh. Bless you, baby. Bless you. <clears throat> All right. I don't, I don't even know what time I started, so I'm sorry. If you get done before I do, you can go. I love you. I, 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 yeah. It's kind of crazy, but it's true. Okay. Oh, wow. We're right up to Matthew 16. That's craziness. Did you ever do that? Where you want to go, where you want to go, and you flip it, and it's right there? Oh, God. Gosh, she says, just, I was talking about it. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, but for flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Verse 17 of chapter 16 of Matthew. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades or the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples to tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Don't you tell anybody who I am. Oh, gosh. Yet he revealed it to these guys. So good. Then Jesus, oh wait, I'm sorry. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, chief priests. Where are you going, JP? And be killed, be raised on the third day. Okay, I'm just making sure. It was Jake, I should have said Jake too. And he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You are not mindful of the things of God, but those that are of men. Jesus said, watch this, check this out. This is so good. He says, if anybody will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross and follow me for whoever would save his life and seek to save his life will lose it. But whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it if a man gains the whole world but uses his, loses his own soul in the midst of it all? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come with all of his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay every man according to his works. Whew, truly I say to you that there's some of you standing here that shall not taste death before you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Super powerful, super powerful. You know, we have heard a gospel that talks to us about one day getting to heaven. Jesus talked about being born again one time, and he talked about the kingdom of God a whole bunch of times. See, getting to heaven is the destination, but heaven getting into you is the goal. So when we get born again, we're actually surrendering our life, our whole life, not just our heart. Keep, keep, understand with me, to believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. Lord means leader, master. It means the master and the leader of my life, the one whom I follow with everything in me. But so many people come to Jesus and they say, yes, Jesus, I believe you died for my sin. And I believe that you paid a price to forgive my sin. But he didn't just pay a price to forgive your sin. He paid a price to remove your sin. 
all the stuff you'd wish you'd never done, all, all those things that you did that you wish you could go back and change, all the things that you regret doing, all the things that you regret were ever done to you, all the horrible things that people did to you, whether you were a kid all the way through life, all that stuff, God doesn't just forgive it. John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He didn't say just forgives. He said, take it away as though it never existed. So here's the problem. This is, this is what we're brought up with. You do the crime, you do the time. I was that guy. And I did the time a lot of times. And I'm guilty. I am the most guilty person ever. I did it all. I did way worse than what they caught me for. All of you have. Every one of you did stuff you never got caught for. I don't care who you are. I don't care how good you are. Everybody did stuff you never got caught for. God saw it all. He saw it all and he went, I love that one right there. (laughs) How merciful is he? we need to be like right there a baby that hasn't been learned that hasn't learned not to trust (laughs) when you were three and you fell down and your dad was around you what'd you do (laughs) why why do people raise their hands in worship We've been taught our whole life not to trust. Don't trust. People hurt you. They're out to get you. Protect yourself. You gotta look out for you. You gotta look out for number one, but in the Bible it teaches you you gotta look out for him. Because if you're your only defense, you're the only defense you have. God is greater than that. God is amazing and he loves us with an everlasting love to see, he wants you to see who he says you are. He wants you to know that he's the rock in which you stand. You know, Jesus preaches the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 through 7. If you look at that, at the end of it, he gives this parable. And he shares about a house. And he says simply this, Matthew 5 through 7 is absolutely a set of impossible scriptures. Jesus is describing the way that he thinks. He's describing the way that he lives. He's describing the way that he fully functions. And he's laying down the declaration of independence for every believer. And he starts it out and he says, blessed are those that are poor in spirit. What does that mean? I am so hungry for who you say I am, that nothing else can satisfy this hunger that is inside of me. Blessed are those that mourn. What does that mean? That means nothing in this world can stop this lovesick feeling that you have inside of you that can only be nurtured by the Father's love. Blessed are the meek. What is meekness? Every part of me is fully dependent upon God. For everything that I say, do, act, think, love, respond, every part of me. Blessed are those that are merciful. Why are you merciful? Because you've been shown great mercy. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. It's a promise of filling. But hungering and thirsting for righteousness is hungering and thirsting for the reality of who God says you are before Him. See, God God doesn't see you for your faults, your failures. Once you repent, when you say, God, I ask you to forgive me, but don't just forgive me. Take this away so that I stop thinking about it. Because God wants to take away the guilt, the shame, the condemnation, all the stuff that you wished you'd never done and all the stuff you wished was never done to you. He wants to take it and make it as if you never did it. Now people will still remember what you did. 
but he can take away the reality of the thought of the memory of what you did when you have the thought and the understanding that God is for you and he is not against you. And he lays the bedrock of foundation in your soul and the way that seems right to a man gets completely shifted because when somebody comes to Christ, it says, behold, if anybody would be in Christ, which means you confess that Jesus is Lord, you believe that he died for you, believe he resurrected for you. It says that one right there, that one right there became a new creation, one that never existed before, that in the eyes of God, it's as if you've never sinned. It's as if, it's, it's, it's freedom. Now, you, you still did stuff, and there are still people that are going to remember that stuff. I mean, I did tremendous things, and I, my gosh, man. But God said, Todd, I want you to believe me that I see you as though you've never sinned, as though you never missed it, as though you never stole from anybody, as though you never did drugs, as though you never did alcohol, as though you never were hooked on pornography from eight years old. I see you as if you've never done any of that. And people are like, well, that's, that's fantasy land, dude. Like, why? Because it's too good to be true. That's why you say it's fantasy land. That's why it's the good news. That's why it's the gospel. See, psychology can't fix you. I'm sorry. I, I mean, I'm, I'm thankful for psychologists, but psychology is the study of fallen man. So when you apply the, the study of fallen man to fallen man, you get a fallen answer. And I am not against psychologists. I've been through a lot of them. I did. Nobody could fix me because the answer wasn't psychological. The answer was supernatural. Because the blood of Jesus doesn't just cleanse the outside. The blood of Jesus cleanses the inside. See, the blood of Christ cleanses the conscience from dead works. He cleanses the heart. He gives you a new heart. Your heart that you used to have was stony and hard and no good for you. But the heart that Jesus puts in you is brand new. It's actually a heart that knows him. Then God gave us this truth, and this truth is pretty thick. And he asks us to study this to show ourselves approved. But because we don't think that we get it, we don't really put our face in it. We wait for someone else to teach us, and we ride on someone else's revelation. Instead of believing that God wants you to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that you might know his hope of his calling. But God wants to reveal himself to you personally as a father and let you know how much he loves you and he'll never turn away from you. If you would see that God's gaze is always on you and he never looks away, you would be like, if you would see that God sits in the theater room of your soul and, and sees everything that goes across your screen, you'd stop putting stuff in that you know he sees. Just saying. That's what changes a man. Love changes a man, changes a woman, makes them a man or a woman of God, makes them somebody that is no longer satisfied with the world. Let me read one more thing to you, Romans 8. Sorry. Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That means that there is condemnation for those that are not in Christ Jesus. But when you come into Christ Jesus and you say yes to him, he moves inside of you. And the first place that he wants to touch is the very place that sin defiled, because sin defiled the conscience. So he wants to take the conscience and he wants to wash it clean by his blood so that your conscience can be clean and you don't have the thought of how, worse, how bad you used to be, but you have the thought of how good he really is. Because it's his kindness that leads you to repentance. Repentance is changing the way that you think. You turn, face him, realize he's for you and not against you. It's the gospel. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Meaning in the law, when you have the law of Moses and you have these 12 or these 10 commandments and 613 laws, 
It's impossible to walk it out in your flesh. Your flesh will fight everything in every one of those. And if you miss one, you transgress them all. So it was like being set up for failure, but God didn't want it to be a setup for failure. He wanted to show you that the law was a tutor to show us our need for a savior. Jesus came in the flesh. He didn't just come as God. He came as the son of man too. So Jesus was fully the son of God, but he was the son of man. And when Jesus did what he did, he had to do what he did as a man in his humanity in order to take the covenant that God made with man, with Moses. Here's the covenant, here's the commandments, here's the law. If you obey all of these, I will be your God and you will be my people. So man fell flat on their face again and again and again. As a matter of fact, God wanted the children to come and talk to him. And when he came on Mount Sinai back then, when Moses was being given all of this, he said, come on, guys, we're going to go and talk to God. Make sure you're ready. The Lord wants to put his fear inside of you so that you don't sin against him. So the children said, uh, no way, dude. He's, we're going to die. We can't talk to God. You talk to God. We'll listen to you. They never listened to Moses. They complained and murmured and gossiped and criticized and all that stuff. And they didn't do it. God didn't want it that way. He wanted personal relationship with them just like he had with Moses. And he wanted to meet with all of us face to face. So Moses is given the law. Nobody obeyed it. It was prophesied that Jesus was coming. Actually, it said, a prophet just like Moses is coming. And he who does not listen to him will be cut off. And that's in the Torah. The Jews didn't believe that that was Jesus, but Jesus came as the Son of God, but the Son of Man. Why the Son of Man? Because the law was made between God and His kids. And in order for His children to have the covenant that God said, if you walk this out and you obey all these that I put before you, you will be my people and I'll be your God. They couldn't do it. So Jesus had to come in the flesh. He had to come in the flesh and he had to operate and live his life as a man, fully God, yet fully man. But he had to not utilize divinitive rights when he was here in order to die our death on the tree. See, in order to pay the price for humanity, Jesus had to live and walk this thing out and he had to never ever sin he had to obey every law every commandment every day of his life without missing one because the, the law is that if you transgress one you've missed them all james 2 10 reiterates that and says it in the new testament if you obey all commandments but you transgress one you're guilty of all which means the only way to do this is to be perfect. So Jesus came to his own and they knew him not. He grew up as a man. He was fully God, but he didn't act as God when he was here. He lived as the son of man. And Jesus went to the tree, went to the cross, and it was amazing. You know, Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, just so you can know and I can put it into context. Jesus' ministry didn't start till he was 30. When he was 30 years old, he comes to the River Jordan to get baptized. The Holy Spirit rests upon Jesus and remains. He went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed by the devil. So all the healing and everything that Jesus did took place as a man in perfect relationship with God, filled with God, covered with God. Uh, okay, I got one amen. amen. I'm trying to preach a million things at once. I'm sorry, but I want to put it in context. You have to know this for the cross to make sense to you. You have to understand. Jesus couldn't hang on the tree as God because God made a covenant with man. If Jesus hung on the tree as God, it's God and God, and that's not the covenant. The covenant is God and man. So Jesus had to suffer. He had to go on that tree willingly See, the enemy thought, if I kill Jesus, I'd get rid of this problem because the devil is a pro or the Jesus was a problem. Because everybody, the devil made sick, all disease, all sickness, all demons, all this stuff. Jesus is messing up his plan. See, he's the prince and power of this world, and he is going after humanity. He's been doing it for all these years, ever since the garden. Jesus shows up. He sees one just like Adam. But he's not the second Adam. Jesus is the last Adam, see? See, Jesus came, and when he was anointed by God, look, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. That scripture alone proves that he did it as the Son of Man. Because God doesn't need anointed. God anointed, look, Jesus was tempted at all points, yet without sin. You cannot tempt God. 
He had to be viably tempted in order for it to be a temptation. Yet he didn't obey any temptation. He went after this thing for you and me. So on the tree, it says that Jesus endured the suffering for the joy set before him. Who was the joy? You and I. But who else was the joy? The Romans. The guy that pulled out his beard, the guy that spit in his face. Who was the joy set before him? The people that did him wrong. Why? Because they didn't know who they were when they did it. They kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it. And Jesus never gave up. He's like, man, these knuckleheads. He never said that. He kept his love on. He never stopped loving. And on that tree, innocence hung on a tree. The devil thought, if I kill this man, if I get them out of the way, he's done. And then we can get on with our program. So what he didn't know and what he didn't understand is that he was crucifying innocent blood. And the covenant said, if you're faithful and if you're diligent to not go to the left and not go to the right, but to obey all these laws put before you, I will be your God and you will be my people. So Jesus is crucified on that tree and at the last words that he says is it is finished. It is finished. What was finished? Everything that Jesus came to do. What else was finished? You trying to get to God through your works is finished. Martha making sandwiches that Jesus never ordered was finished. The one thing that matters is what Mary was doing gazing at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus said it was finished. And it said that he gave up the ghost, gave up the Holy Spirit right there. And the Bible says that Jesus descended into the depths of the earth. My belief system actually is that Jesus went to hell. The devil really thought he won. You can believe what you want. I found it in scripture that Jesus went to pay a penalty that he didn't even do. And he went to pay for the sin of mankind. And three days later, the devil thought, yes, we won. It says in the Bible in, oh gosh, guys, everywhere. But in Colossians, it says that if the powers and principalities would have known what they were doing, They would have never done what they did, but they did. So there has to be a huge cover-up scandal to try to block what really happened. Because if they can block what really happened, you'll never get the full effect of bedrock. You'll live on sand. You'll never get the full effect of the revelation of Jesus Christ. You'll live on shifting sand in your house when the storms come, because the storms come to both. Jesus said, he who hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to the wise man that builds his house upon the rock. And when the storms come, when they come, it doesn't say they're not gonna come, it says when they come. Jesus didn't have you sign up for a life of bliss. He didn't say sign up for a joy ride. He said sign up and die to yourself because you now have a fight of faith that you're in. You no longer fight the devil, you fight, you fight the fight of faith to maintain the reality of the truth that he's called you to be. And the storms come. But if I don't know who God is and my foundation isn't solid and I don't hear these sayings of his and do them, I am a man that builds his house upon the sand. And when the storms come, the house collapses. And great is the fall. Great is the collapse. This is crazy, crazy talk. The same word rock is the same word rock here. Same word rock in Matthew 16. And upon this rock I'm gonna build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What are the gates of hell? The way that seems right to a man. Upon this rock, the revelation of Jesus, I'm going to build my church. Simon says, this will never ever happen to you. Get behind me, Satan. Your mind is full of the things of man. What is the gates of hell? The way that seems right to a man, it is demonic thinking that comes against everything that you're created to be. So good. Yet, 
very crafty because the enemy is crafty. He will take what you think is normal and you will make that doctrine and that is not normal to act that way, to respond that way. Well, you don't know what they did to me. Well, you don't know what they said to me. You don't know how they hurt me. All that stuff is the way that seems right to a man. There's no forgiveness in it. Jesus told the disciples, who's ever sinned, you forgive or forgive, and who's ever you retain or retain. And it was a commandment for us. Why? Because if they don't believe that you forgive, they'll never believe that he does. If they can't see his church, which is supposed to be his body, the people that actually go to the building, the people that are a part of the body of Christ, if they see you walking in unforgiveness, then they will believe that your God is full of unforgiveness. But if they see you, if they see you walking in forgiveness, they'll believe that the God that you serve is a forgiving God. So what do we do in the body of Christ? Get attitudes, get problems, have issues with people. They rub me the wrong way. I'm just not going to associate with them. We build boundaries. We put boundaries around ourselves to protect ourselves and our false identity. And we call it Jesus. It's not Jesus. It's sin. How are you like me now? I'm talking about the truth here. I'm not talking about some mumbo jumbo, nicey nice, wow, have it your way. This isn't Burger King. He is the king. I can't afford to think another way. I have to think like he thinks. I can't afford to give you my opinion. I have to know the truth and let that truth set me free, keep me free. And if there's something in my life that's out of order, when I read this book and it shows that my life is not this, I need to change the way I think because this is truth and what I'm believing is a lie. And when you believe the lie, you empower the liar. It says, for those, in verse 7, or verse 5 of Romans 8, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. That means of the things of the world, of the things that seem right to a man. It says, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. What is the things of the Spirit? It says, set your mind on things above and not beneath. It says, to be heavenly minded, but earthly incredible. To be carnally minded is death. To think like the way that the world thinks is death. What is in that death? You sin, you die. The wages of sin is death. But more than that, not that that's not enough, but there's a way that seems right to a man and it leads to destruction. What is in that destruction? Guilt, condemnation, shame, and regret, which all lead to fear. And that is to be carnally minded, and that is killing us. He's the only answer. But he didn't want you to just incorporate him into your life, he wanted you to surrender your life. He didn't say go into the world and make confessing Christians, he said go into all the world and make disciples. But a disciple is one that continues in his word. People are like, well, you don't understand. I've tried. This is hard to understand. I get it, but you're trying to get it with your carnal mind. And you can't. Because it says that it's revealed to the Spirit. So here's the deal. You get born again. You become brand new in your spirit. You have a brand new spirit, man. It's a recreated spirit where your spirit is one with God. And all of a sudden, you are a Christian, but you're in infancy. So infancy can last a lifetime if you let it. Peter says, desire, which means to have a fervency and urgency to desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. What does that mean? That means, that hurts. Gosh, I overdid it, but I'm going to be okay because tomorrow I'll feel more better. To desire the pure milk of the word. I want you to think with me real quick. Ladies, I mean, when you have a child, men, you know it too. How long does the pacifier work? How long? Just a little hunger sets in, that pacifier. Are you, I'm serious. I mean, come on, anybody that's had a baby, whether you're breastfeeding or whether you're bottle feeding, it doesn't matter. The bottle has to be there to satisfy the hunger of the child. 
Because the pacifier will work for a little bit, but there comes a time, put it back in. In our house, we say, the baby's ready for the mama booba. I'm serious, that's what we said. My daughter just had our first granddaughter, and I say, ooh, she wants the mama booba here. I give her back. She goes, Dad, stop saying that. I go, it's what we say. But what we're saying is, it's time for the baby to eat. And so people can be born again, which is essential to unlock your potential, but your potential isn't realized until you start to, until you start to feed on what is going to grow your spirit. So we have people that have been Christians for 50 years that don't read the Bible because they tried and it didn't work. They tried and it didn't work. And they tried again. I'm not saying you never tried. I get it. But we're trying to read it the way that we've learned other books. And this book cannot be learned the way that you learn any book. This word is alive. Watch. The word of God is alive, sharp, and active. Hebrews 4.12. Sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide your soul from your spirit. So the first thing the word comes to do is it divides the way that seems right to a man to the way that is right to God. So your mind is trying to get in and it can't get in. Your heart's already there. Your spirit and your heart, they become one. You're linked up. You're like, oh. You read and all of a sudden your heart is like, But your mind is like, why? Because this thing is out of the equation. It's out of the equation. Now for me, I never read a book before, so reading the Bible was off limits. I mean, if you never read a regular book, you open the Bible, just say you flip open to Leviticus. No way, What, what was that, what was that? Right? Even just a little bit, like the fatty liver and the, the offering and the, it's just crazy. It doesn't make any sense. Why? Because it's not for your brain. See, your heart can take you places that your mind can never fit. And if you would dare to say, God, I don't know you like I need to, and this word is alive, and you're going to train my spirit to be so one with you, and my brain is going to get it after my spirit gets filled with the truth because it's the truth that sets you free carnally minded is war against God spiritually minded is one with God so when we say yes to Jesus how many of you guys know that when you say yes to Jesus and you come to the cross you come to Calvary all of a sudden you're like oh my gosh you're like how many of you know like once you said yes to Jesus do you remember when you said yes I'm doing that because it's really bright in here and I want to see you. Did you. Does anybody remember when you first got born again? Like the first time you said yes to Jesus, like you threw paper in the trash and it missed and you picked it up. You're like, oh my gosh. I, that was me. You know, oh, there you are. Okay. All right. It was intimate. Now it's a little brighter. Now I can see your eyes. No. But when you get first, when you get saved, the first time you get saved, the first time the revelation of Jesus, the revelation of who Christ is, hits you and you realize, He loves me. You're like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. Cry at the altar, you're like, oh yeah, so good. Wow, and then you leave the church and you're like, it was really good back there. And I was there. But if you never find out what He says about you, you have to keep coming back here in order to feel good. And I don't want you to not go to church because we need to be a part. Don't forsake the assembling together of the saints. But you have to see that God doesn't call you a sinner anymore. He calls you a saint. That's weird for people because you know you grow up Catholic and it's St. John, St. Peter, St. But the Bible says that the pastors, the pastors, apostles, evangelists, teachers, prophets are for the equipping of the saints for the works of ministry. Saint doesn't mean perfect. It means a holy one set apart by God. Why does God give you the Holy Spirit? Because holiness has now come inside of you. The Spirit of God is in you, hooked to your spirit. And He wants to show you that you're right with God. And He wants you to understand that I have right standing with God. God doesn't look away when I talk to Him. He's looking right at me even before I said anything. And if your gaze catches his gaze, it's over for the enemy because he had to go like this. 
You don't even see him anymore. All you see is the father going, I love you. So proud of you. I'm so excited. God, here's God. I'm so excited that you've come to be with me, Todd. We're in my closet, in my hotel when no one's there. Todd, I'm so excited that you're here. Me too. No, 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 Todd, I'm more excited than you. You got me there, God. But can you let me taste and see that you're good so that I can be excited like you when I come in here? (laughs) Why do I witness? Because I'm in love. Why do I share my faith? Because I believe. You're not supposed to just be an evangelist. You're supposed to be a believer. But as a believer, God's called you to be a witness. All of you are called to be witnesses. If you said yes to Jesus, you're a witness. If you didn't, you should. I would ask you, if you didn't, what are you waiting for? (laughs) You've tasted the world and it doesn't fulfill you. You've tasted stuff. I tasted rock music. I tasted it all. I tasted drugs, alcohol, pornography. I tasted all of it. None of it fulfilled me. All it did would mask the real problem. The real problem is that I didn't know him. But once I met him, I became addicted to Jesus. I became a Jesus junkie. I became one that's so in love with him that I don't need alcohol anymore. It didn't fulfill me anyway. My buzz always wore off. When you get high, I don't care, man. I smoked an ounce of weed a week for 20 years, man. And every time I'd get high, I would go, whoa, but it would go away. And I'd have to breathe, I'd have to get high again to get back up. And there's no high like the most high. Yeah. And it's not about a buzz. It's not about a buzz or a euphoria. It's about the ecstasy of knowing his love for me. and drinking of the river of his delights. Because <laughs> he likes to live in me. And he wants to live in you and he wants you to know that he likes to live in you. When you first get saved, all of this experience is, it's a whole new world. And it's amazing and, oh my gosh, you love me. Woo! Yes, and then you read it. You really love me. What? Amazing love, how can it be? You, my king, would die for me. (laughs) I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. (laughs) Life then becomes worship. Your whole life becomes a worship service, whether you're here or whether you're out there. Exercise becomes worship unto the Lord. Your school becomes worship unto the Lord. Your job becomes worship unto the Lord. Why? Because I'm doing my job unto Him and not for people. Man, you can get really bored with working 12-hour shifts, man. I mean, it's a hard thing to do that. It's really hard until you realize Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened down and weighed down by life. Come to me, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, Jesus says. The way that we take that yoke upon us is we actually learn from him. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I am meek and lowly, gentle. If you learn from me, you'll find rest for your soul. Where's the storm in here? Come on. It's all coming together, buddy. He's good to me. I went down so many rabbit holes, bud. You don't understand. He's a good father. But the truth is the storm inside is only settled when you realize that you're right with God and that he loves you. Oh, how he loves you. Then the storm inside settles because you realize you actually have peace with the one that created you. And when you have that peace with the one that created you, you can finally be still and know that he is God. And when you get quiet and you go to be alone with the Lord, the storm inside is silent. Why? 
because you are one with him and you have peace with the creator now you're going into a place with the creator to learn why he created you I don't know why anybody would ever want to get out of this I see people looking at me like just tell me how I do I see it right now I see it people just tell me how okay this is all great it sounds great what's the catch you you're the only catch here nobody else is the catch you're the catch the Bible says if any man come to me let him first deny himself pick up his cross and follow me if any man desire to come to me let him deny himself deny the way that seems right to a man deny your feelings deny your hurts and your pains and all the things you've been offended by and how much you are against people because of what they did to you they held me down all that stuff you're gonna drop that junk in order to be free you gotta say I don't want to go down that road I actually want to run with Jesus I am not going to keep thinking this way. I want to be free. And you have to walk in forgiveness and you have to say, I am not going to hold this junk against them. Now that I know he's forgiven me of all of this, who could I be to hold that against them? I show mercy. Well, here's my question. My big question is who's ready to surrender and say, I'm done thinking this way, and I want Him. I want Jesus, and I'm not holding anything back from Him. And if that's you, and you know that this thing has been trapped, and you want to be free, and you know that unforgiveness is trying to rule your life, and you want to let that stuff go, you want to deny yourself, and you want to go after Jesus, come up here right now. Just come up here. Come on. This isn't technical. This is gospel. This is the good news. <laughs> this is the truth that sets you free, keeps you free, and lets you love and be loved by the Father. He loves you. He's not mad at you. He loves you. He wants you. He, he desires to know you. He, he's a good king. He, like him there's no one like him there's no one like him there's no one like him yeah he loves us oh how he loves us oh
see his beauty and I see his love for me. I don't have time to maintain regrets. I don't have time to hold on to this stuff. I don't have time to hold on offenses against people. I don't have time to hold on forgiveness towards people. I gotta let that stuff go. Do you understand? That's what this song is about. When Kim Walker wrote this song, that's what she was thinking, because I know Kim. That is what she was thinking when she wrote this. I don't have time to maintain these regrets. My heart burns violently inside of my chest. It turns inside of my chest, and I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think, when my mind is full about the things that he says he loves me. All that stuff dies. All that stuff dies. So just pray with me right now, Lord Jesus. Right now, we choose to forgive. We let go of all that stuff that people did tell us. God, we want to walk in your love, in your goodness, in your mercy, in your grace. We want to realize how poor we are in spirit. Because it says that theirs is the kingdom of God. We want to learn how to mourn, meaning nothing satisfies my soul but you. Father, right now, I confess that you are not just Savior. You are my leader. You are my Lord. You are my everything. I give my heart to you again for you to clean out the trash. I give this mind to you right now and I ask you to write your truth on it as a blank canvas wash my soul my conscience with the blood of Jesus right now in Jesus name